the, the point in all of that is not to say, hey, look at us, we're doing it right. The, the point is just to, just to help people realize really meeting the needs of the poor, really, really serving in that kind of way takes a long-term investment, um, and it takes individuals, not just organizations. Mid-South Viewpoint, a Christian news and information feature of Bot Radio Network 640 AM, discussing the news, views, issues, and concerns that affect our community. Join us now for today's edition of Mid-South Viewpoint. It all started in Jackson, Mississippi. I was born in Jackson, moved around a little bit, but from about kindergarten on, Jonesboro, Arkansas. So was in and out of Memphis most of my young life because that was the big city closest to us. And uh, um, then from there, went to college at Ole Miss. Um, so a lot of people either love or hate that around here. <laughs> um, and uh, that's really where I got connected to SOS for the first time uh, as a freshman in college came for a weekend back in the more grassroots days of, of SOS. And, um, and yeah, and eventually now, 13 years down the road, uh, after that first experience and, and working there and serving there. Tom Marino and James Lofton were in the youth ministry at Christ Methodist at the time, and they were taking their kids all over the country to do mission trips. And they had kind of a desire to do two things. One, they saw there was a great need in our own city. And two, they wanted to do it as as an out as an outpouring, as an outflow of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They they didn't they saw a lot of mission work going on in the country that was just nice people doing nice things for other people, um, but no real tie to the gospel. And so they wanted to be a Christ centered ministry, meeting the needs of the poor um, here in Memphis. It started as a as a home repair ministry, and that's still the the core of what we do. Um, as we go into low uh, low income neighborhoods. Um, work with low-income homeowners to do repairs on their home that they're financially unable to do on their own. We do all the work for free. It's all done with volunteers, and we um, we ask that the homeowners participate in the work. We don't want to do the work for them, but we want them to want we want to work alongside of them to make their home warmer, safer, and drier, and even more beautiful. It started really back in the mid '90s, um, you know, from influence influences like John Perkins and, and Bob Lupton, kind of some of the pillars in urban Christian community development. Um, some of our leaders at the time uh, were in, uh, influenced by some of the books that those guys had written and met with uh, Bob Lupton even and realized that the, the most strategic way to do what we were doing is to, to, to focus on a specific neighborhood. And so Binghampton was chosen as our target neighborhood back in the mid-90s and Christ Methodist um, was was doing a lot of other work in the neighborhood as well, and so that just made a lot of sense. It was it was in the center of the city. It was close to the church. Um, there was uh, a lot of need there at the time, and uh, but there were also a lot of great opportunities. So we started there, um, and then uh, and that's that's where we've been working for years. And it wasn't until in the last four or five years we started to ask ourselves. We are at capacity in Binghampton, meaning we we are we are turning away volunteers every year because our camps are full. Um, there, there's no shortage of people wanting to come and serve in our city. So, and there's also there's obviously other neighborhoods of need. So we began to look around and and eventually identified Orange Mound as another neighborhood where we felt like we could partner and spent almost a year meeting people, praying, seeking out opportunities, just seeing if that would be a good fit. And eventually felt like the door was open for us to be there. So in 2009, we started our first camp in Orange Mound as well. Orange Mound is a almost entirely African-American community. It's historically an African-American community, whereas Binghampton has always had a little bit more diversity. There's been, there's there there's not just African-Americans, there's Caucasians, there's Hispanics, there's um, uh, some Asian families, there's even, uh, there's a lot of African refugees and Middle Eastern refugees from places like Afghanistan and Somalia and Burundi. So B Binghampton, I mean, they're, they're totally different neighborhoods. I, I know that Christ Methodist, uh, the intention when SOS first worked there, um, and, and by the way, as a side note, we are, in, in 1999, uh, SOS had grown so much that Christ Methodist decided to um, essentially birth SOS as its own nonprofit ministry. So we, we wanted to be able to reach more churches, reach a, a broader denominational base. And so we're, at this point, we're no longer officially tied to Christ Methodist, although they're obviously still a great supporter of our work and we're still very connected. Um, but at the time when we we're still connected with Christ Methodist, um, I think they went into it looking at it as a partnership. They never wanted to just go in and say, hey, we're coming to save this neighborhood. But they went in small, they, they partnered with neighborhoods, they 
they, you know, they partnered with some uh, people in the area and, and eventually uh, we got to where we were a very well accepted and well known name in Binghampton. And today the SOS logo is possibly the most recognizable logo in Binghampton. I mean, so many homeowners, so many residents of Binghampton, if you're wearing an SOS shirt, you're immediately accepted. Now in Orange Mound, um, it, it was different. Uh, again, we, we spent about a year walking around, getting to know people, getting to know community leaders. And, um, and there was a lot of pushback at first, you know, there was, there was some, there's some real community pride in Orange Mound. That's really great that, that there's this real sense of unity and this is, this is our community and it's, it's a historical community and there's a lot of great things going on here. And so, you know, we're outsiders coming in and that, you know, a lot of people were thinking, you know, we don't know you, we don't, we don't know the work you do. Um, you know, we've got a lot of great things going on. And, and so we, we had to be really careful. We never wanted to come in to say, Hey, you've got all these problems. Let us come fix them. We wanted to just come in and say, Hey, we've, we've got this experience and these resources. We see that maybe we could be a partner here and, and be of help here. And so eventually, I mean, for example, one of the things we wanted to name our camp there, SOS Orange Mound, and we felt some resistance there from some different community leaders. And so we didn't, we didn't name it that where our camp in Orange Mound is called SOS 114. It's the three at 114 zip code. And um, so, yeah, so you have, to, we had to be really sensitive and careful because there really are some great things going on in Orange Mound and Binghampton. And we don't want to presume that, you know, we have it all figured out and we're coming to fix all the problems. We really want to just say, hey, God has gifted us with these resources and experiences as a home repair camp. And if you would allow us, we would love to come alongside you to, to help grow this neighborhood, make this neighborhood a healthier, nicer place to live for those people who really care about it. Our mission is that we exist to, uh, to glorify God by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and deed through urban home repair camps. And so we, we, it's, it's not a either or or a one is an excuse to the other. We, we really see this tension in the church where there's a lot of organizations who will do, you know, quote, mercy ministries like home repair to get their foot in the door so they can talk about Jesus. And then there's others who say, no, you don't need to talk about Jesus. Just go and serve people and fix their home. And we would say that really you need to and should, and the Bible commands that we do both. And so we don't view the home repair as just a means to an end, as just a way to talk about Jesus. We see the home repair as a valid expression of the gospel, but we also seek to, through Bible studies with our campers at the work site, um, through and inviting the homeowners to participate in that, through um, a gospel presentation at a picnic every week in the neighborhood, through evening chapel services for our campers. We hire college summer staff and equip them to be leaders and disciple makers. So through all of those avenues, we're wanting people to not only see the gospel through our works, but to hear the gospel through our words as well. We really believe that serving others over ourselves is one of the clearest and most tangible expressions of the gospel. A great example would be seeing in, in John 13 when Jesus is washing his disciples' feet. If you think about the characteristics of, of how he's serving them, he's doing a task that is beneath him. He is doing a task that is unexpected. You know, Peter says, well, what are you doing? You shouldn't wash my feet. He's doing a task that is undeserved because Judas would betray him, Peter would deny him, and yet he still washed their feet. Um, he's doing a task that, um, that is costly, right? He was washing with the, the garment tied around his waist and it was dirty, and he was meeting a real need. Their, their feet were genuinely dirty from walking around in sandals on dirt streets. And when we see that in light of the gospel, where's the greatest example of doing something beneath someone? dying on the cross for the sins of the world by the Son of God? Where's the greatest example of someone uh, doing, loving someone in an unexpected way, the cross of Jesus Christ? Where's the greatest example of loving someone in an undeserved way, Jesus, the perfect, sinless Son of God, dying for the sins of the world, the greatest example of meeting a real need, bearing the penalty for our sin on the cross, and the greatest example of costly love, obviously it costs the Son of God his life. And so, that's, and that's why we see that the home repair that we do is so important. It is not just an excuse to get us to someone's house so we can talk about Jesus. Literally putting nails in shingles and roofs and fixing houses and windows and doors and painting, all of those are a tangible physical demonstration of principles of the gospel that, that, that translate in a real way to homeowners. I was actually a music major in college. I was a choir guy, sang in choir, directed choir. Um, still love doing that today, but um, I, and I heard you like to sing in falsetto. Uh, yeah, is that right? <laughs> yes, it's probably not going to happen on this broadcast. <laughs> yeah, I love to sing choral music. Uh, you know, and, and help uh, our listeners who might not be musically inclined. What falsetto is? And, yeah, so false. You know, if you you know, most men speak and sing lower, obviously. Um, but you know, you can flip up and kind of fake like you're singing like a girl, and and it's 
it's actually, I mean, a lot of guys actually do what they're called counter tenors, and they actually flip up into falsetto, which is kind of a head voice, a light, really high voice. And um, a lot of people make their living as, as counter tenors, the singing in their falsetto. And so, Is that your stress relief? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, as, when people ask me, as, you know, what do I sing in choir? I say, well, I sing bass, baritone, but I'm kind of a closet alto. You know, I really like to sing the alto part. So anyway, so yeah, that's that's you know, obviously revealing some of my own quirky, quirkiness. But so I went to Ole Miss, yeah, sang in the choir there, um, loved choral music. But I, and I, so I grew up, I, I grew up loving music, but I grew up kind of in a cultural Christianity world. I, I went to church quite a bit. Um, you know, if you've read Tim Keller's Prodigal God, I was the older brother through and through growing up. Um, and went to Ole Miss and um, kind of, excuse me, realized that, realized at Ole Miss that I was not a believer. I mean, I just kind of grew up thinking I was a Christian because I tried to obey the rules and the ones I didn't obey, I justified it and really started following Jesus in, in uh, college, realized that I was lost and helpless and, and was would never be good enough to earn favor with God uh, except through Jesus Christ. And so became a believer in college, started following Christ. Um, and, and I had done mission trips growing up. I mean, I'd gone and done rural home repair projects and things like that. So I'd, already, I'd, been ex, I'd had the blessing of being exposed to low-income situations and families with real needs. I'd been exposed to the hurting and pain of others in a way that, get, that stirred compassion with me, although at an earlier age it wasn't, it wasn't a result of the gospel as much as it was just seeing that as hard. So then when I, when I started following Jesus, um, got involved with campus ministries and began to do mission trips again, went to SOS. And kind of for the first time at SOS, I feel like I saw this meshing of proclaiming the truth of the gospel as well as living what you say you believed. And I saw that in men like David Montague, who's now the the executive director of the Memphis Teacher Residency, and Tom Marino, who used to be the director of SOS and now is involved in uh, other, other ministries in Memphis. And, and and I saw men like that who who spoke the truth of God and lived it out. And and I hadn't really seen a lot of that in a lot of the older role models in my life. And, and I was very attracted to that. And I said, man, that's that's what I see Jesus doing. He he tells people to repent and to believe the gospel. He's not soft on proclaiming the truth of the, of the gospel, but yet he reaches out and touches lepers and heals the blind and makes time for the least of these. And so I think that's kind of following Christ and seeing that lived out through SOS was was incredibly attractive to me as a young believer and and wanted so badly to to be living that kind of life and so just you know continue to be involved with SOS and God continue to open doors for me to to do that it's I've just been humbled and broken in so many ways of learning leadership lessons the hard way and learning how to do my job again you know I wasn't don't have a degree in ministry or business I mean I, I was a music major in choral music and now I'm you know, have, managing full-time staff in a ministry setting and recruiting thousands of volunteers and raising money and, you know, balancing budgets and all these things that are that I've had to learn somewhat on the fly, and God's been really gracious to me in that for sure. Um, and, and I think also just the challenge of, you know, wanting to, wanting to connect the church to the, the work that we're doing and, and us making sure that we are not feeling like we are the professionals at this urban ministry thing, and not only that, but helping others to realize that we're not the professionals. We, we just want to equip people and, and cast a vision for people to, to do the work of the church by meeting the needs of the poor. You know, a lot of times it's churches, especially larger churches, um, with very great intentions, you know, have, they've become more institutionalized. So there's all kinds of programs and things in place. And they, you know, church leaders want their people to be engaged in the work of the church. And in a larger church, the you know it seems like the ways that that's done, been done in the past is through programmatic serving. So they you know, hey, can we send a group of this many people on this date to serve in this community? And and you know th those things are great, but at, at the end of the day, we just found that doing really effective ministry and and especially in the urban context, it takes time. It's always messy. It takes relationships, um, it, and it, it just can't be done for three hours on a Saturday. And, and not, not to say that those things are bad. I think a lot of times people from churches um, are exposed to what God is doing for the first time through a very small service project. And, and, you know, so we know that some people get hooked, so to speak, and want to come back and serve. But, but it is, you know, it's a challenge of 
sometimes we see that these kind of short service projects, um, they, you know, it, they do meet real needs and they are, they are effective, but in some ways they're also a lot of work. And sometimes we question, well, are these really transforming this neighborhood or is this just a way to, to help this church maybe provide a program for some of their members? And so it really is a tightrope because I, I, and I don't think by and large, I don't think churches are, are, are doing that with bad intentions or bad... I think there really is a desire to serve and to bless these communities. Over 2,000 volunteers a year. Most of those are high school and junior high students, a lot of college students, a lot of local church members and adults. And and so we really try to build on that. We, we don't just... In other words, we don't just set up projects for people to go do home repair, but we take every opportunity to, to cast that vision before people because what we've found and what we really want people to, to realize is that... Yes, SOS may be an opportunity to serve, but but one thing that we've tried to model is we we have been in ministry for 26 years now. We've been focused in one neighborhood for 15 plus years now. Many of our full-time staff and interns moved into Binghampton and live there. And and the the point in all of that is not to say, hey, look at us, we're doing it right. The the point is just to just to help people realize, really meeting the needs of the poor, really really serving that kind of way takes a long-term investment, um, and it takes individuals, not just organizations. And so um, we, we want people to catch a vision for that and to find ways to invest in relationships over the long term, and whether that means living in a community like that or just regularly being involved in people's lives in that community. I, I, think, I think those are some of the things that we try to model and to, and to really cast vision for for volunteers that come and work with us. That that doing a one-week mission trip with SOS is great, but but you can't just check that off a box and say, I've done my Christian service for the year, that God calls us to a lifestyle of loving and serving those uh, around us. And particularly, I think God has a particular heart towards the poor and the needy, and when you, you see that throughout Scripture. The gospel is not just we are sinners who need Jesus so we can spend eternity with him in heaven. But the gospel is this idea that all of creation is broken. All of creation is wrecked because of sin. And and God is in the process of redeeming that. And one day we'll completely redeem that but through through Jesus Christ. And so we're we're just trying to paint a small picture of that now and and to recognize that that doing good deeds and serving the poor is not just something that that would be a nice thing to do, but it literally is a is an integral part of the gospel. And we and we really can't. I would argue that we really can't do gospel ministry without meeting the needs of the poor, um, because I, I see that's what we see Jesus doing, and it, and it is is always connected with the gospel. Every week in the summer, in in Binghampton, we'll have about 185 campers, and about 30 or 35 in Orange Mound. Um, and then we also have local churches that adopt a week of camp, and so they'll send anywhere from 50 to 100 volunteers throughout the week to help with various tasks. And then we have spring break camps in March for college students for four weeks, and then we have some weekend service days uh, in the fall. So between all of those, it ends up, you know, well over 2,000 people are coming and serving in some way with our ministry. This year, we have groups from a, as far away as um, Washington State. We've had groups from New York State and Florida and Texas. I would say most of our groups are coming kind of the Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, Illinois, Michigan, over to Pennsylvania, Carolinas, Florida, that kind of section, you know, kind of Midwest and eastern section of our country. We don't have a ton coming from the, the far northeast or, or out west. Um, but yeah, literally all, but we have, I and mean, we've had groups come from Seattle and from Ithaca, New York, and uh, and uh, Jackson, Wyoming, so really from all over. One of our college summer staff from last year is at a school in eastern Tennessee, I can't remember the name of it. Um, and he was he met an, an older lady one day at a copy machine and got to talking about life and he said oh well I'm from Memphis she said oh I'm from Memphis and he said yeah and worked for an organization called SOS and long story short this lady um, was was a neighbor of one of the homes where we worked in Binghampton several years ago and seeing all of the young people and getting to know all the volunteers there kind of inspired her to actually go back to school and so this lady was now in college as a result of of spending some time around some of our volunteers. Um, we've got, you know, there's a young married couple who are really dear to me. They they came to our ministry as college students, and we're just, um, r God really transformed them through serving. They each served two or three summers on our summer staff. They're married now, and they moved into Binghampton. Uh, they live in Binghampton, and God is just doing so many cool things. They've developed relationships with their neighbors and people in Binghampton, and have 
God, you know, God has really used those to, to transform them and also to be a blessing to others. And uh, just, I mean, see constant stories. There, there's, there's a ministry in San Antonio, Texas called Blueprint Ministries um, that is essentially uh, run just like SOS is. And it was from a church there that had come to SOS for 15 years, wow. caught a vision for what we're doing. And now they're running their own home repair camp in San Antonio. And, and so, the, I mean, those are the kind of things that we love and we praise God for and we celebrate um, because at the end of the day, we see that our ministry to the poor is is two ways. It is direct through our home repair, that we're literally meeting the needs of the low-income homeowners in Memphis, Tennessee through repairing their homes. And then it's also indirect through equipping and empowering others to love and serve the poor in the name of Christ. And so what's great about that is that happens all over the world. I mean, we've got alumni who are serving as missionaries all over the world in the 1040 window and are serving in other inner city neighborhoods. In fact, in Memphis, Tennessee alone, we realized, I, I counted up the other day, there are over 60 individuals in Memphis, Tennessee who are either living in a low-income neighborhood or are working for a ministry in a low-income neighborhood, and they first came to, to Memphis through summer staff at SOS. So over 60 people in Memphis are doing urban ministry in Memphis alone through coming to SOS. And then that's not to mention the countless others elsewhere in the country and the world. So God has really given us just a great platform to cast a vision for loving and serving the poor as a response to the gospel. The best ways to get introduced is, is to come and do a week of camp or to do a work day in the fall. And so that's primarily for college students or junior or senior high students, but they need adult leaders to lead those trips. And so if you're a part of a church in Memphis or wherever you are, um, and, and looking for an opportunity to serve in a low-income neighborhood and hopefully in a way that, that transforms not only our neighborhood but also your group, would say consider coming and bringing a group of students to either um, our summer camps in Binghampton Orange Mound or our college camps in the spring or coming and do a, a day of service in the fall. And all of that can be found on our website, sosmemphis.org. Um, also, we, we have, um, you know, for college, college students and young men and women out there, we have every year we hire about 45 college students to serve as summer interns um, to help us run our camps and invest in those communities. And we also have a one-year urban internship for college-age uh, men and women who come and live in Binghampton for a year. We train them, equip them, they serve with other ministries, um, and it's a great way to get um, a year worth of practical experience in the urban ministry world. And then beyond that, we, you know, we have local churches who will adopt a week of camp, send volunteers um, to come each week that we have camp and help with various needs. And then lastly, I would just say we, you know, we have a lot of groups call us from churches and say, we want to serve, what can we do? We have a lot of relationships with homeowners that have needs that maybe are the projects are smaller than we can do in a week of camp or it's in the, kind of the off season so we can't get to it. So, but they may be perfect for a Saturday project, and so we can try to help connect families or Sunday school classes with these homeowners that may have some needs and kind of just basically be a middleman and say, hey, here's a homeowner we know that has some needs, and here's his family, and connect them and see if they can you know, develop their own relationship and their own work project, things like that. Thanks for listening to Mid-South Viewpoint. If you'd like to join the conversation, you can email us. Our address is wcrv at botradionetwork.com. This has been Mid-South Viewpoint, another Christian news and information feature from Bot Radio Network 640 AM.